Now, today's webinar is Functional Status and Disability in the Canadian Longitudinal Study on a Aging. Welcome to our speaker, a uh, Alexander Mayhew. Alexander Mayhew is a PhD candidate in the Department of Health Research Methods, Evidence and Impact, HEI, at McMaster University. She previously completed her Bachelor's of Applied Science at the University of Guelph in Applied Human Nutrition and a Master's in Health Research Methodology at McMaster's University. Her current re area of research includes estimating dietary intake in large cohort studies, assessing methods of defining muscle mass loss in older adults, and understanding patterns of physical function and disability limitations. Again, before we start, uh, let's remember that there will be a question and answer session at the very end of the webinar, but please feel free to write in any questions or comments at any time during the webinar in the chat box, and we'll get to it at the end of the session. Um, just as a reminder, when I pass over to um, Alex to start her uh, talk here, she will be speaking uh, even though it's under Catherine Galley's um, hosting capability. So I will pass it over to Alex Mayhew to begin her talk. Okay, thank you to everybody for joining us today um, and to Carol for the great introduction. Uh, so as she mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about functional status and disability in the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging. And we're, I'm gonna be talking about how we've chosen to define functional status and disability for a project that we've been working on the prevalence of those variables, as well as the relationship between function and disability. Uh, so the rationale for this project was pretty straightforward. Uh, we know that maintaining independence throughout the aging process is a key concern for older adults, as well as health and social services. Age-related disabilities have numerous implications, uh, such as the increased demand for health care, a reduced quality of life, an increased cost of care, and higher mortality. <clears throat> So there's been a big emphasis on trying to find ways of keeping people from becoming disabled um, as long as possible and having them live independently. And one of the areas of research has been in functional impairments. And that's because functional impairments are thought to precede disability and therefore may allow for early interventions to prevent or delay disability. So ideally we wanna see more older adults uh, living as the woman on the picture on the right is uh, who's um, Perhaps in her own home, she's still preparing food for herself, despite being an older age. Uh, so we had three primary goals with this project. Uh, the first was to estimate the prevalence of functional limitations in the CLSA. And we did this both in the comprehensive cohort as well as the tracking cohort, and they are measured differently between the two cohorts. Um, so we have a questionnaire-based self-assessment in the tracking cohort and performance-based testing in the comprehensive cohort. We want to estimate the prevalence of disability in the CLSA and explore the relationship between the measures of functional limitations and disability. And uh, though there are many different models of disability available, we decided to focus on Navi's disablement model. Um, it felt it fit in best with the overall goals of our project, and it is one of the most commonly used models as well. And according to Nagi's disablement model, uh, people pass through uh, four different stages. Originally, there's some sort of pathology or pathophysiology um, problem that happens, and this could be due to disease or illness, and that may progress on to an impairment, which then could become a functional limitation, which is one of the focuses of today's talk, and some functional limitations then progress on to disability. Focusing on those last two boxes, the big distinction between a functional limitation and disability, uh, according to Nagi's disablement model, is that disabilities stop people from being able to do the things that mean something to them in life. Um, and you'll see on uh, the figure here that they do talk about social aspects. Um, so it could be that people aren't able to get out and about the way that they want to, to participate socially. It could be that they're unable to care for themselves the way that they want to. And this model does suggest that there's an interaction between the environment and the individual. Uh, so some environments are certainly more conducive to allowing people with functional limitations to keep on doing those tasks that are important to them, uh, while some environments are less conducive to that. So within the uh, CLSA, uh, disability is defined the same way in both the tracking cohort and the comprehensive cohort. 
And um, there's multiple variables that get at that kind of social participation element. But what we've chosen to focus on are activities of daily living. And those could be further subdivided into basic activities of daily living, uh, which are mostly self-care tasks, including uh, being able to feed yourself, bathe yourself, make it to the toilet in time, get dressed, uh, move about in short distances, and get in and out of bed, as well as look after appearances. Then there are also instrumental activities of daily living, and these are more complex tasks. They don't necessarily relate to self-care, but they are necessary for people to continue to live independently. Uh, so it's the ability to do things like grocery shopping or go out and buy clothing, manage your own money, take medications, use the telephone, go to places outside of walking distance, prepare your meals, and do housework. Uh, so as I alluded to, um, there are different functional status measures in the CLSA. Um, so unfortunately, this makes this presentation a little bit uh, difficult to follow along with at times. So I'll always try and make sure that um, it's clear which measures we're referring to. Uh, so we had those objective interviewer administered performance tests in the comprehensive cohort of nearly 30 or just over 30,000 participants and the subjective self-reported questionnaire in the telephone cohort um, or the tracking cohort of 20,000. And we know that um, self-reported measures of function and performance testing are strongly correlated when they're actually measuring the same sort of underlying domains. On the flip side, uh, performance testing and disability are only moderately correlated, uh, but this is what you would expect because they're supposed to be getting at slightly different constructs that are related um, but shouldn't be identical. Um, it's quite interesting that there is a bit of a paucity of evidence about the association of self-reported measures of physical function and disability. And this is because uh, there's a lot of uh, messiness in the literature about how to actually, what terminology to use to describe these constructs. So when you're looking at self-reported measures of physical function, in many cases, people are actually using activities of daily living to identify this. So there aren't as many uh, studies comparing questionnaires to questionnaires as are the performance measures to activities of daily living. But regardless of how you measure uh, performance, um, be it through the performance tests or the self-reported questionnaires, there is a strong association with disability, mortality, and other poor health outcomes. So in the tracking cohort with that physical function questionnaire, uh, we have previously done a factor analysis to try and determine if there were any underlying domains. Uh, so we went, in it, went into that without any uh, real theory about exactly what was going to come out. So it was data driven. Uh, but what we found is that three domains emerged. We had upper body limitations, uh, which include a variety of tasks. Um, some of them require things like strength. So for example, lifting 10 pounds from the floor. And some of them are a bit more of a mobility or range of motion issue, such as washing your back. And there are six questions for that. Uh, we also found a domain for lower body limitations. And similarly, these require tasks where range of motion is important, such as stooping, kneeling, and crouching, as well as tasks that are a bit more strength or um, endurance related, such as being able to stand up after sitting in a chair or walking two to three city blocks. There were only two questions uh, for dexterity related limitations, and that was handling small objects and using a knife to cut food. Uh, we do have uh, the performance measures in the comprehensive cohort. Uh, so very briefly, there are five of them. Gate speed, um, which is very commonly used. And in the CLSA, uh, specifically, it's a four meter walk test at people's usual walking speed. And we did calculate that into meters per second. Uh, it was a four meter course. We just divided the number of seconds it took by the meters. Uh, there's a timed up and go test where participants have to get up from a chair, walk three meters, turn around and walk back to the chair and sit down again. A balance test. Um, and we had participants uh, first balance on their right leg, then on their left leg. And this was measured up to 60 seconds or whenever their other foot hit the floor or if they used the wall to stabilize themselves. And for the purposes of this project, we use the best time, regardless of if it is the right or left leg. There's the chair rise test, uh, which participants have to get up and down from a chair five times without using their arms. And grip strength, which was uh, done in the dominant hand. We use the highest value of the three repetitions that each participant did. And this was all done using a hand grip strength dynamometer.
Uh, in terms of participant characteristics, I'm sure many of you are quite familiar at this point uh, with the data from the CLSA, uh, but we do have a mean age of about 63, and that's reflective of the 45 to uh, 85 year olds that were recruited. Uh, it's about a 50-50 breakdown between males and females. The uh, mean BMI is 27.7, so uh, just in the overweight category. We do have a relatively educated population, uh, so 75.5% of our participants have a post-secondary degree or diploma. And similarly, we do have relatively high income participants um, with a bit of a skew towards those higher income categories. And uh, we looked at the number of chronic conditions and at least 67% 60, of participants had at least one of these present. Uh, so first I'm gonna discuss the prevalence of disability. Uh, so for disability, we were looking at people who required assistance with at least one activity of daily living or instrumental activity of daily living task. And the reason we chose to operationalize it this way is that we actually don't have a particularly high prevalence of disability in the CLSA. So we felt that it was better uh, to leave those clumped together, uh, though there's certainly some limitations that I'll discuss later about that. Uh, because it gave us a sufficient sample size for the logistic regression analyses that we'll be discussing later. Um, but what we do see is that for disability, uh, the prevalence, uh, there's quite a dose response across the age categories, um, and that females consistently do experience more disability than males do. And we found that certain tasks uh, were more likely to be endorsed than others. So for example, getting to the bathroom in time and uh, doing housework were two of the most problematic tasks. Um, but it still was relatively low prevalence for each individual task. And uh, this makes sense because once people have accumulated uh, two or three or more deficits, um, they're probably likely to require some sort of assisted care facility. And um, that's in the context of the development of activities of daily living. Originally, uh, they were used for uh, care settings to, just, to determine resource allocation. Um, so it was things that you're expecting people to need a lot of hands-on help with. And the prevalence of the questionnaire-based functional limitations, so this is in the tracking cohort, uh, we've chosen to subdivide this by those domains we came up with in the factor analyses. So we have upper body tasks, lower body tasks, and then dexterity. So the slide that we're on is focusing on having difficulty with at least one upper body task. And you see the exact same trend that you did with the prevalence of disability. Overall, um, there's an increase in the prevalence across the age groups in both males and females. And consistently, females are having more difficulty than males are. You'll also note that the absolute amount of uh, limitations is higher in all of these age and sex strata. Um, so it's indicating that more people are having upper body task limitations compared to ADL or IADL disabilities. And this slide uh, has the same setup, but it's uh, looking at lower body tasks. Uh, so you'll notice that the prevalence of lower body task limitations is higher than the upper body tasks were. And uh, same trend increasing across the age groups. Uh, what was interesting to see is that um, Males actually have more limitations in the low or a higher prevalence of limitations in the lowest age bracket compared to females. Uh, we have a few hypotheses about why this uh, might have happened, and it could be that uh, males are doing more demanding tasks and therefore feel like they're actually having more difficulty with them in reporting that. Uh, but there's that's just our hypothesis, and there's no way of proving that at this point in time. And uh, then finally, we are looking at difficulty with at least one dexterity-related task. And you can note um, that even in that oldest age group in the females, the prevalence is still less than 15%. Um, so this is indicating that there's not a lot of people in the sample who are having difficulty with these dexterity tasks, but there were also only two of those included in the questionnaire. Um, so it makes sense that there would be lower prevalence than either upper body or lower body limitations for which there were six questions for each of those. And it could be that they're actually more simple tasks in terms of using a knife or picking up small objects that uh, people are genuinely having fewer uh, challenges with. But you see that same dose response across uh, the age groups. And then once again, females consistently are reporting more limitations compared to the males.
Uh, we also looked at normative values for the functional limitations. Uh, so even though our original goal, uh, we set out to come up with the prevalence of functional limitations for those performance tests included in the comprehensive cohort. What we found in the literature was there aren't a lot of great cut points to indicate who is actually functionally limited. And something that was really uh, disregarded consistently throughout the literature was uh, the implications of which age groups were included in developing those cut points. And I think our data really nicely shows that this isn't something sh uh, that should be ignored because people who are in younger age groups should have higher performance than those in older age groups. And there may not just be one absolute cutoff uh, that applies to everybody for saying that they're starting to have a problem. Um, so here are the uh, normative values for gait speed uh, measured in meters per second. So in this case, you want to have a higher value that indicates a higher performance. Uh, there's not a huge difference between males and females, especially in that younger age group. However, as uh, the age groups progress, uh, there does seem to be a bit more of a separation between the two. And it is very clear uh, that performance does decrease with age. And if we're looking at the literature, uh, generally the cut points that are recommended are either 0 0.8 or 1.0 meters per second. And it's quite interesting to look at how uh, that would fit in with this data. Uh, so in the youngest age group, if you were using a cutoff of 0 0.8, um, there would be very, very few people that would be considered functionally limited whatsoever. Um, but there would be a good deal of people in the older age group that would be functionally limited. And you'd be identifying a very different population if you use that 1.0 meters per second cutoff. Um, so again, that's something that just hasn't really been thoroughly discussed in the literature. The second performance test is the timed up and go test. Um, so for this one, taking more time uh, means lower performance because it's taking you longer to get up, walk three meters and get back to the chair and sit down again. Um, again, you don't see a huge difference between males and females, but there is very clearly a dose response. And as people are getting older, um, it is taking them longer to perform this test. A, one of my favorites is the balance test. Uh, so this one is in seconds. So you want people to be balancing for as long as possible. And this one uh, perhaps has the most profound uh, decrease across the different age groups. So we find in our youngest participants, a lot of them have no problem balancing for the full 60 seconds. And the mean balance time in both males and females is over 50 seconds. But by the time you get into that 75 years and older age group, um, the mean balance time is less than 20 seconds. And quite anecdotally from uh, having done some of the data collection, there's a lot of participants who pretty much their foot comes off the ground and immediately it goes back down. So they only have a time of one to three seconds uh, for balance, though there are still plenty of older adults uh, who are able to balance for the full 60 seconds. Uh, so unfortunately, these graphs don't really show the heterogeneity, um, but there's a lot more older adults um, that are on either far end of the spectrum compared to the younger adults who pretty consistently all perform well. And uh, this graph is for the chair rise test. Um, so in this one, you want lower values opposed to higher. Uh, very, very little difference between males and females, but you see that increasing trend as people get older. And the last uh, graph here is for mean hand grip strength measured in kilograms, um, also stratified by age and sex. And um, this is a test, it's very well known in the literature that males and females do have different um, grip strength potentials with males being significantly higher than females. So cutoffs are recommended uh, specifically for each uh, sex. This isn't something that necessarily happens for the other performance tests. But as we saw, there's not nearly as radical of a difference between them. Um, however, what still is ignored in the literature is the fact that um, grip strength does very clearly show a decrease across these age groups. And it may look as though the males are losing much more grip strength than females, and they are in terms of absolute number of kilograms. But if you look at the percentage of hand grip strength, uh, or the difference in percentage hand grip strength between the age categories, it's actually quite similar between males and females. So the bigger absolute change is just reflective of the higher starting value for the males. Uh, but very clearly, it decreases as participants were getting older. Uh, so that's kind of it for all the descriptive statistics. 
um, we wanted to start looking at the relationship between function and disability. And it's very clear in Nagi's model, as well as other disablement models, that uh, physical function is supposed to precede um, disability. Unfortunately, we can't actually show that causal relationship. Uh, we were only using the baseline data from the CLSA. Uh, so we can't establish temporality, but there is a really strong theoretical framework for this. All right. Um, so for each of the models, our outcome was having at least one activity of basic activity of daily living or instrumental activity of daily living limit limitation. Uh, so as I said before, we decided to operationalize it this way simply because of uh, sample size issues where not that many people had um, one or the other. Uh, it was better to combine them. And uh, we have four different models for both the tracking cohort or telephone cohort, as well as the in-person cohort or comprehensive cohort. And these different models, uh, we're trying to just assess uh, physical function in different ways to understand if different combinations of limitations were associated uh, with disability in different ways, if it matters if the number of domains um, limited were considered, and what the concurrent adjustment of each of those variables were. Um, I'll get into more detail about exactly what those mean in the next slides, but that's the gist of what we did. And all models were adjusted for age, sex, the number of chronic conditions, self-rated pain, household income, depression status, body mass index, alcohol consumption, and cognitive decline. So for the telephone-only cohort or tracking cohort with that questionnaire-based assessment of physical function, uh, these were the main results. So in model one, we just compared people who had at least one limitation, regardless of which domain it was, versus not having any limitations whatsoever. And we found that the odds of having an ADL or IADL disability was 3.67. In the next model, and um, even though it doesn't look like uh, perhaps the most impactful model, we haven't been able to find any other literature which is concurrently looked at these different domains within the same model, and I suspect that's largely a sample size issue. Uh, for this analysis, we had still 20,000 participants to include, which gave us nice narrow confidence intervals for this analysis, which other studies aren't necessarily able to achieve. Uh, so what we found is that each of these uh, different domains, upper body, lower body, and dexterity, are independently associated uh, with activities of daily living disability. Uh, so this is quite an exciting finding because it does show that these domains are uh, measuring different underlying constructs all related to function. For model number three, we looked at the number of domains with at least one limitation. And for this, we didn't care which domain was impacted, uh, just the number of uh, domains. And we were quite shocked to see that when participants had all three domains limited, uh, the odds of having an ADL or IDL disability was 13.11. Um, it is a bit of a wider confidence interval, um, but it's still a very, very strong effect size. And then you see that uh, decrease uh, down to 6.69 uh, for the odds ratio for having any of the two domains limited. And um, having just one domain limited, the odds ratio is 1.90. Uh, so again, this is a very exciting uh, result for us because it's showing that as people have more domains that are impacted, um, you definitely see that increase in the risk of disability. And model four is the one looking at the individual combinations of the domains with at least one limitation. Um, so not surprisingly, all three limitations, um, the odds ratio of 13.19 matched up quite nicely with uh, model three with having three domains limited because those are essentially exactly the same. Um, and then we have the different combinations of two uh, domains impacted. And we did find that upper body and lower body limitations in combination seem to have the uh, highest risk of disability, um, compa especially compared to lower body and dexterity limitations where the confidence intervals weren't overlapping. Uh, for upper body and dexterity limitations, um, for whatever reason, there's a very small number of participants in that category, hence the wide confidence interval. So you can't say if it's significantly different from either of the other two. And then certainly for each one of the individual or individual variables, uh, those were all very similar and overlapping with a range of uh, 1.87 as the odds ratio to 2.71. 
And for the in-person cohort, uh, so based on those performance tests uh, for physical function, the models all were uh, structured the same way as for the tracking cohort. So in model one, uh, they're having at least one test in the lowest performance quintile. We found an odds ratio of uh, 2.22. And uh, similarly as the other uh, model two for the tracking cohort, we uh, adjusted for the presence or absence of the lowest quintile of performance uh, for each of the individual tests. And um, again, we found that each of them were independently associated with um, having an activity of daily living disability. So again, a very exciting result that we haven't been able to find anywhere else in the literature. For model three, we were looking at the number of tests um, in the lowest performance quintile, disregarding which specific test it was. So once again, there's that very nice dose response. And in particular, it seems when people move from having uh, three tests in the lowest quintile to four tests in the lowest quintile or five, that's where you see the most dramatic increases in the odds ratio for having an activity of living disability, activity of daily living uh, disability. And uh, model four, I apologize that it's quite large. Um, I'll also note that there are six variables that are six combinations that have been taken out due to a lack of statistical significance. And some of those were individual variables. So you'll note that the timed up and go isn't included on here. And some of them were combinations of either two, three, or four. So there wasn't a clear pattern about uh, which results were statistically significant and which weren't. Uh, but what is shown here are all the ones that um, still were statistically significant. And you do see that dose response in general, that as the number of tests in the lowest uh, quintile of performance, as they were accumulated, um, the odds ratio went up. Um, but I think in general, this indicates that there's not a huge difference necessarily between the different combinations of tests. And even if we left all the data in that uh, wasn't statistically significant, uh, the confidence intervals were wide enough and the point estimates were high enough uh, that they would still overlap. Um, so that's pretty much it for what we did for the analyses. Um, so we found that overall, 9% of participants had at least one activity of daily, activity of, uh, daily living limitations. And this is quite similar to the estimates in the uh, Canadian Community Health Survey, particularly when you start stratifying um, by age, uh, so those age 65 and older. And it is very consistent in the literature that more females have limitations than males. Um, something that I'm quite curious about is, is this a reporting issue where females are just more likely to say that they're having challenges? Or is it that females really are experiencing more challenges in comparison to males? Um, and for physical function limitations, um, we did find that they're more prevalent than activities of daily living disability. And there's uh, two possible explanations for this. So it could be that the questions are phrased quite differently. So for the physical function questionnaire, it's very explicit in asking, uh, do you have difficulty completing this task? Whereas for the activities of daily living, it's phrased, uh, do you require assistance doing this task? Or are you able to do the task independently? Uh, so it's quite likely that more people are going to say that um, they have difficulty doing a task, but they don't require assistance. And there are a small number of studies in the literature that have confirmed this. Then there are people uh, just saying that they require assistance, but don't find the task challenging. Um, and this uh, is indicative that uh, these limitations do precede disability. So part of it could be the phrasing of the questions, and it could also be that the questions themselves are easier tasks. Um, or less complex, so people are going to have more issues with them. So you can have difficulty with stooping, kneeling, and crouching, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to progress onto a disability unless you've reached a certain threshold of having difficulties with that. Uh, we did find that there is a strong association between function and disability, regardless of if it is measured by questionnaire or performance testing. And this was a great, exciting finding uh, for the CLSA because unfortunately, we did not do the questionnaire based and the performance testing in any of the same individuals. So the fact that the results were so consistent um, between the tracking cohort and comprehensive cohort lends itself to um, saying that both of these tests are probably good, valid measures. Um, and though we can't directly compare them head to head, they probably are getting close to some of those same underlying constructs. 
And we did find that there is an independent effect of each domain of function in the questionnaire-based assessment and performance-based on uh, performance-based measures for disability. And again, as far as we know, this has never been done in the literature, um, and it has important clinical implications, as it's suggesting that looking at multiple domains or doing multiple performance tests is going to be clinically relevant for helping to decide who's most at risk of um, having a disability, and uh, perhaps those are the people that should be prioritized for interventions. And of course, uh, we do have limitations. Um, I think one of the biggest limitations is that we did only use activities of daily living to define disability. Um, it's well known in the literature that these are limited in scope. I already said before that they were developed originally for determining uh, resource allocation and care settings. So they're not perhaps the most relevant to community dwelling older adults, and that was reflected in the generally low prevalence. And because of the low prevalence, we were unable to look at things like different combinations of activities of daily living um, and which performance tests perhaps were predicting which uh, deficits in those activities of daily living. Uh, though as our CLSA population ages and grows, uh, hopefully we'll be able to start answering questions like that. Um, there's also very little understanding of how uh, performance tests and questionnaire-based measures of physical function map onto one another. And because we don't have those done in the same people in the CLSA, unfortunately, that's not something that we were able to assess. Uh, there is also overlap between uh, the activities of daily living questionnaire and the physical function questionnaire. And this happens all the time in the literature, and unfortunately, our questionnaires are no exception. So, for example, there's uh, questions about walking in both, even though they're for different distances. Um, it still does, uh, perhaps those constructs are too closely related. Uh, there's also the issue of a lack of clinically validated cut points for performance testing. Um, so I've said before that there hasn't really been any discussion of the importance of the role of age. And I do think that this uh, project really nicely illustrates that this isn't something that should be ignored and that we know that the performance tests differ. I didn't present the data for it um, in this presentation, but we have stratified those values by healthy uh, participants who didn't have any sort of disability and didn't use mobility aids versus unhealthy participants who did have disability or use mobility aids. And we found that there are uh, big differences in the values for healthy, there's unhealthy young participants who would still have a higher gait speed compared to healthy older participants. Uh, so it seems like one threshold applied to multiple age groups just isn't going to cut it. And to really assess these, we do need longitudinal data, um, but I think that's something very exciting that we can do at the CLSA data in the future. And of course, we weren't able to assess the causal relationship between physical function and disability. Uh, for that, once again, we are going to need longitudinal data. So in conclusion, in this analysis of over 51,000 participants from the CLSA, the overall prevalence of disability was about 9%. And we found that functional limitations are more prevalent than disability. And within the domains, we found that lower body limitations were the most prevalent at about 41%. Upper body limitations were the second most prevalent at around 25% overall. And dexterity related limitations only impacted 7% of participants. It's clear that functional status is lower in older adults, but unclear where the cut points should be, and therefore we couldn't assess prevalence. And on all measures, females tended to be more limited than males, with only a few small exceptions. And uh, we did find that regardless of how you operationalize physical function, there is a strong relationship uh, with disability assessed by activities of daily living. Um, and I'd like to give a quick shout out uh, to my collaborators. Uh, without them, this project certainly never uh, would have gotten off the ground and they've provided really important uh, support and advice and guidance uh, throughout this process. Um, and now I think we'll open up the floor to some questions. Thank you, Alex. That was really a, a really excellent presentation and, and well presented. Um, I'd now like to open it up to questions. Just a reminder to everybody that muting remains on, but you can enter your question into the chat box in the bottom right-hand corner of the WebEx window, and I'll go ahead and read it out, and um, we can discuss the question and answer session that way. So to get started, um, there's a question from Jin Liu. What is the variation with age change? Are they similar of the ranges or getting larger? 
So I also kind of had a question about maybe you could talk a little bit more about that heterogeneity that you discussed as as age increases. Uh, generally, there is an increase in the heterogeneity for all the performance tests with age, um, and I think that speaks to just the general heterogeneity in aging, um, which is part of the whole premise underlying why we're doing the CLSA. Uh, so as people age, you do end up having very high performers who, for whatever reason, have been able to maintain their performance uh, status. And given that we only use the baseline data, we can't say if people uh, just had much higher absolute values to start, and therefore, even though they've declined, they're still much higher than average, or if they've uh, just experienced less decrease compared to their peers. Um, and then you also, on the flip side, have people who um, have very low values in the older age groups. And again, we can't be sure if it's because they haven't aged as well or if they just started off at a lower value. Um, but that is definitely observed that uh, the spread becomes wider as people get older. And did you say that you did look at those well, those those good performing older adults compared to the poorly performing older adults? And we did. Uh, so the data wasn't included in the slides, uh, but we did find. Um, I, I can't recall exactly uh, what the difference ended up being. I think in some ways. Um, it was fairly consistent across the age groups where poor performers, the magnitude of difference between them and or between the healthy individuals and the unhealthy, the magnitude of the difference was similar for each of the age categories. Um, so it wasn't necessarily that the poor perform or the unhealthy older adults had a huge difference from the healthy ones, but that wasn't observed in the younger people. It was fairly consistent throughout. Yeah, that'll be interesting to see on the longitudinal data. It will be. <laughs> Another question from uh, Yixing Chao, what statistical packages are used? And I'll also uh, tack on a small question just to, to specify that all of your quintiles were age and sex specific? Yes, thank you uh, for highlighting that they were age and sex specific quintiles. Um, and we used STATA for all of our analyses, or sorry, SAS for all of our analyses. Okay. Um, so we have time and space for more questions, so feel free to type it into the chat box and I'll uh, read it out. But uh, I'll go ahead with a couple of other questions here. So uh, how would you look at environmental factors that are related to the disability process? What measures would you consider to look at that kind of wider environmental issues? Uh, that hasn't been um, honestly something that I've given too, too much thought to uh, yet in terms of these projects. Um, I think some of the variables that you can use to measure uh, disability lend themselves more so to that environment than others. Um, so I would be very interested in looking at how these functional uh, tests and the questionnaire end up associating uh, with variables such as are people being held back from participating in community uh, related events as much as they would like given uh, their functional status. So there's some more uh, subjective measures that are really people's opinions about what they're able to do versus not able to do and how that impacts them rather than just saying um, if they have require assistance with the task or not. So I think that would be a good starting point. And um, we do have some great variables in the CLSA for things like social support availability um, that I think would be interesting to see if they um, end up moderating the relationship between function and disability. Yeah, yeah but there's a lot of, lot of uh, interest in kind of the built environment and the social isolation pieces of all of that, which would be interesting to explore, I'm, I'm assuming. Is. And yeah. I think we uh, need a more environmental uh, collaborators uh, to really begin to unpack that because it right. wouldn't be simple or easy, but certainly worthwhile to look into. Uh, just a reminder to everybody, if you want to write a question, make sure that you send the question to all presenters, not just the host. So click all, all, all presenters or all for that question. So another question from Walter Wittich, are there specific reasons why you choose to include measures of vision and hearing in your models given their link, why you did not probably, given their link to ADLs and IADLs? Uh, that's something that we're looking at in some further analyses. Um, so we're interested in vision and hearing as uh, more moderating variables, and that seems to be how they're coming out. 
Um, so that is something that's on our radar to look into, and um, it certainly is important. And our yeah, preliminary results, I can't cite numbers, unfortunately, um, but the results of that analysis that we've run so far do indicate um, that uh, people who have a vision impairment or as specifically vision ends up really impacting disability. It was mm -hmm. The effect was far uh, less so in those with hearing limitations. That's, that would be very interesting. Um, Mark K. asked, did you use the CLSA weights in your descriptive and regression analysis? We did. Uh, so we used the inflation weights uh, for all of the descriptive analyses. So uh, the results presented today should be generalizable to the entire um, Canadian population. And we used the analytic weights uh, for the regression models. Um, so both were weighted, absolutely. Excellent. Uh, a question from Lily. You mentioned previously that functional limitations include psychological and social limitations with ability. How do you think these are defined and measured? Uh, so that's certainly a limitation of this project, uh, that we right. really were focused on the physical limitations rather than psychological or social. Um, so I think there's a lot of thought that has to be given. It's a bit easier, I think, choosing the disability outcomes for the psychological and social limita or disabilities than the limitation side of it. Um, so again, that's something that we'd really like to do, but we just haven't uh, quite gotten the right team of people together that provide us with the expertise to be able to consider those. Um, but it is a very worthwhile endeavor. Um, and it does require, uh, from what we've looked at, you have to be a bit creative with the CLSA data because um, there's not just one questionnaire that's necessarily going to get at those constructs for you, which is why we definitely need the additional expertise. Right. Uh, another question from uh, Judy Bedell from Ying. Did you consider some factors such as ethnic groups and cultural background in your analysis? Uh, we did. Um, and. We tried those out for the regression modeling, but unfortunately, uh, they weren't statistically significant within the models, and that really comes down to uh, the sample size. Our population within the CLSA is very uh, heavily weighted towards those of European descent, um, so I just don't think we had the sample size to figure out anything for those other different ethnic groups, especially given that we had a relatively small number of people with the outcome of interest. Right but we would expect to see that there could be some ethnic differences there. And uh, perhaps that's something that if people are accumulating more disability or if we operationalize disability in a different way, we might have the power to start looking at that. There's another comment from Mark Kay about being able to access the PowerPoint slides. So um, I'll leave that for uh, our communication director to uh, write in the comment section about how that happens as we move on with the questions. For the comprehensive cohort, did you adjust for province and your models? Again, from Yin. Uh, that we did. Um, and that's part of the, when you follow the waiting document that's available on the CLSA website, that's something that uh, you're supposed to do. So. We followed that recommendation, and uh, that wasn't included as a covariate, uh, though I guess technically it should have been in that list. Was it significant? Uh, generally not. A couple of the provinces were significantly different, uh, but for the most part, there wasn't any rhyme or reason. And uh, we did do some pre-analyses looking at perhaps if region mattered um, and grouping the provinces by region, and that by and large is very null. So it seems it was something that was in the model for the weighting, uh, but doesn't have any big implications or any big conclusions. We'll keep asking questions for about five more minutes here. Um, Lori Churchmatch asks, which test results did you use to adjust for the cognitive function? So again, that that list of the um, founders that you used. So for, I remember the acronym of that, and I'm just going to try and uh, find if I wrote that down somewhere. So it was the MAT test, uh, which I think is the alternating word and number test. Sorry, just trying to look that up quickly. 
Uh, yes, the mental alternation test. And uh, we did a standardized score with a mean of 50 and standard deviation of 10. And participants with a score of less than 35 um, were considered to be cognitively impaired. Okay. Was that age and sex adjust, uh, specific? Uh, that. <sighs> so we talked about the provincial differences. So we have a question from Jang Lu about, did you look at any geographical differences? And I, again, I think you, you included it, but didn't look at it specifically. Uh, we did do some investigative analyses. Um, um, so that was the clumping of the Atlantic provinces together, the prairies together, uh, but there's really nothing that came through. So it doesn't seem like there's some sort of pattern where certain areas of Canada are having a stronger relationship between function and disability than others. So this might go with the, the environmental factor question as well, but did you look at rural, rural uh, urban environment? Uh, no, that's something we haven't, and I think that's uh, something really worthwhile to look into. Another question uh, from Judy Beldol. Do you anticipate a time when functional exercises will become a standard of care versus rest, chronic sitting, and inactivity? The research on this is getting old. Uh, well, I personally certainly hope so. Um, I, I'm always surprised that we still haven't really uh, focused on eating well and moving as the treatment to a lot of different chronic conditions and just in general improving the life of people. Um, but of course, it's easier to say get up and move and eat correctly than it is to get people to do that. Um, but I do think I would agree that the research is getting old, but I do think it's consistent um, the showing that really if people can do some sort of exercise and there's a lot of great work coming out of the kinesiology department at McMaster showing it doesn't even have to be extreme levels of exercise. It can just be walking or it can be 10 minutes bursts of exercise uh, that can end up having huge um, improvements in terms of people's function. Um, but I'm not sure. I think there's a lot of, um, it'd be hard to kind of take, we like treating problems as a healthcare, or our healthcare system tends to treat problems after they've already emerged. And at that point in time, it's easier to throw medications and other things at people rather than make those lifestyle changes, which I think is quite a shame. And there's a comment which I'll read from uh, from Judy Bettel again. See the Canadian Center on Aging Activity and Aging. We need to train all PSWs and all staff being trained in supporting this. So another question was comorbidity status taken into account. Uh, we did adjust Jingle. for the number of chronic conditions that people that, had. And we chronic did the condition systems. It was the systems. Um, so we were less, if people had multiple very similar uh, conditions, those were clustered to, or they're grouped together. So we had musculoskeletal conditions, respiratory conditions, cardiovascular related ones, metabolic. Uh, so I think we had 10 categories overall that we looked at for the chronic conditions. Okay. Any final questions to put in? One final comment from Judy. Yes, we give people walkers and wheelchairs for fall prevention rather than exercise prescription. So the need uh, for this research and uh, the communication on the discussion around this research, I think we all agree is very important. Well, thank you again, um, Alex Mayhew. We greatly appreciate your participation in the CLSA webinar series and thought it was extremely interesting and uh, Good presentation. Hey, well, thank I'd you like, very much for having me. I'd like to remind everyone that CLSA data access request applications are ongoing. Uh, please visit our CLSA website under data access to review uh, available data, further information on the CLSA platform, and details about the application process. I'd also like to say that our next webinar is scheduled for March. Uh, we'll be welcoming Dr. Yoko. Uh, Isha Gama Doyle um, to talk about assisted devices use among community dwelling older adults. So please uh, join us for uh, March's webin CLSA webinar series. So please register soon and join us for that webinar. And thank you for everybody for attending today's presentation.